I'm the chair for the session this afternoon, and it gives me great pleasure uh, to invite you all to this most uh, distinguished uh, speech this afternoon by our guest, uh, Professor uh, Gwindavir Molnar from the Institute of Education at the University of, of uh, Seged in uh, Hungary. As I think you've come to expect, we are delighted to welcome our plenary speaker, an award-winning and renowned scholar. And I just want to take you through a couple of, uh, let's say, netiquette before we get starting, started and I introduce our speaker more formally. This afternoon, we will be presenting, uh, having the presentation for about 45 minutes. And then we will follow that with questions and discussion for the remainder of the time. We are in a session here until 3.30 this afternoon. I would request that you mute yourself when you're not asking questions, but I'd very much like to encourage you to build up to our discussion after the session. And so I'd like you to um, introduce yourself now in the chat, put your name in, say which country you're from, where you have just to give a bit of information also to our speaker so that she understands where you're coming from and also to get used to uh, putting in some comments and some questions as we go through what I know is going to be both a very uh, in-depth scholarly discussion but also quite an entertaining discussion today. So I'd like to invite your involvement as we go through the presentation itself. Um, I'd like to ask you for this first part, just to keep your video off. But once we get to the discussion, please, if you would put your video on as far as your bandwidth will allow, it will allow us to see you, uh, but only after the presentation, please. Then after the presentation, we're gonna ask you to use your raise hand option um, so that we can invite you to give your question orally or I have, uh, I've asked and encouraged you please to write your question in the chat. We really, we really would like to encourage you to use the chat this afternoon. So this keynote address comes, and I have to say, Prof Molna is standing on the shoulders of giants here and being a giant herself, she belongs in this space in a very, very good way. Just to share with you that these keynotes, and I know that uh, Monica Rosen, our link convener, talked about this just now in our network meeting. So this tradition that this network has of keynote addresses stretches back to 2014, when in fact, uh, Cheert Plomp from the University of the Netherlands, who was the former uh, chairperson of the IEA, uh, he, he actually was the very first, I think, keynote that we did. And uh, it, it was quite an important occasion at that stage because, in fact, uh, many of you will remember that Chet Plomp was instrumental in starting the whole movement of uh, the European Education Research Association. And together with, I think it was uh, joined and encouraged Sandra Johnson and a few others uh, to actually start this network. So this has quite a rich history and anybody wanting to know more about the history and more about these presentations and keynotes, we'd encourage you to go and look at the um, website uh, for the EORA and have a look and follow these pre previous presentations that were made. So what I'm very excited about and unashamedly excited about is that we have our first female presenter. If you look at these names, they are all giants, they are male giants, and the time has come to introduce our female giants. So I, um, I say that because I would also like to make another comment, if I may, because the first thing I'd like to say about our dear Professor Molnar here is that in addition to all the amazing things that you would see from her uh, biography and her full curriculum vitae is of course very, very impressive, as you would expect of a scholar speaking at this network. But the first thing I'd like to say is that she is also a mother, a mother of two, I believe, and is married. 
So three, oh my word, we have to update your bio. <laughs> Congratulations. So colleagues, uh, this, is, this is also very special and perhaps many of you will have realized in the time of COVID, for those of you that are not only mothers, but parents, um, just how much is going on right now. So to many of you, we'll come back to that, I'm sure in the discussion. But just to say, it's very special to have a scholar of the standing. And in addition to that, she brings um, that life experience. So a little bit more about uh, Professor Molnar. She is a full professor in learning and instruction um, in Hungary. She's the director of the Institute of Education since 2017, deputy head of the Doctoral School of Education. So you can see her management responsibilities are quite considerable. Originally, she's a qualified secondary school teacher with mathematics, German and literature. And after that, after she qualified as a, as a school teacher, she then also obtained her PhD in 2004, where after she also, uh, it seems like 13 years later, went back and got a, a Doctor of Science, which is quite special. Um, her thesis was actually technology-based testing and education, as in assessing improvement in problem-solving ability. So you can see her colleagues where the interest is coming from. Her main areas of interest include technology-based assessment, uh, improving cognitive skills, studying the quality of school learning, and the potential for using ICT in education, all of which are aimed at improving the quality of learning. And that topic, this, this network spends a lot of time talking about that. She heads EDEA, an online diagnostic testing system used in several countries. She's published very widely, both domestically and internationally. For the full list, you're welcome to go and look at the extensive curriculum vitae. Importantly, she's also a member of several uh, national and international professional organizations. So for instance, um, she's been the president of the Educational and Psychology Committee of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. Uh, she serves on editorial boards of numerous domestic and international journals. And just for brevity's sake, I just mentioned uh, technology, knowledge and learning, for instance. She's won many, several prestigious awards for her work. These include a number of awards from the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, as well as her university, and amongst many others, two international awards. Um, one as the most innovative teacher at the Innovative Teacher Forum in Paris. And of course, she's also been uh, representing Hungary in an international leadership program uh, over in the United States. So colleagues, I think you will agree with me that we are most fortunate to uh, have attracted a scholar of Prof. Molnar's caliber to present to us on such a current topic. And I think that that's what we've become incredibly aware of recently, more recently than before. So I'd like to encourage you to type those comments and, and questions in the chat. Points of clarification, reflections and questions are all very welcome. We will monitor and collate them for the discussion time. And now I will invite our distinguished speaker to present her lecture. And we look forward very much uh, Gunjavir, to hearing from you and uh, listening to your talk. Thank you. Over to you. You need to mute yourself, John Javar. You're muted. <laughs> No. Yes. Okay. There you go. Now we're here. Okay. okay good. So, <laughs> thank you. Then, thank you, Sarah, for the really kind introduction. It's really, really hard to say anything after this. So, uh, let me start my presentation with a quotation from Kelvin: <clears throat> "If you cannot measure it, you cannot improve it." So nowadays. Your smartphone offers workout programs for you if you decide to lose weight after enter 
a few important parameters, for example, height, weight, age, and gender, and of course, your goal. As you do sport, your smartwatch continuously monitors your time, calories burned, pulse rate, heart rate. More accurate, personalized workout programs are provided for you based on these data. In parallel, technology can contribute to personalizing education by even predicting what type of task and activities would be most beneficial for you or for your students, for different students. But where we are today? Why is the one-size-fits approach so broadly, widely applied? And why is the one-size-fits approach inefficient? How can we best use technology to help students learn? One of the main challenges of skill education stems from the fact that students are different. Moreover, students are different, not only one single dimension, but also in a number of different ways. And even these differences, which is really hard, are changing dynamically over time. As you can see on the two figures I brought you, they come from two different fields, from the field of problem solving, and the other one comes from the field which is really explicitly trained at school. This comes from math. As you can see, the both figures look quite similar. What does it mean? The differences between the students within the same grade are much larger than the average development between students in grade three, grade nine, or grade one to grade nine, or 10, or even later. So we can conclude that age does not determine skills and abilities. Despite this fact, schools typically teach the same content to all students at the same time at the same age, that the same content cannot match the readiness and needs of our students. As a result, if you look at our curricula, our teaching methods, school material may be perfect for some, but too difficult or too easy for others. But technology can help to address this issue and personalize education. So if you look around us, we can see that children of today have been surrounded by digital technology, which has been embedded in their daily life. However, they do necessarily able to integrate these technologies into meaningful practices. And I mean under meaningful practices, for example, learning practices. And because of it, they cannot really take advantage of what technology offer them. Just certain paradoxes and delusions associated with that generation that needs to be considered as the belief that they know all about ICT is a fatal misconception. Several problems could have been solved. Several problems wouldn't have been raised if they could use technology for learning. And in most of the times when they use technology, they learn. It means that they brain also learn. And this would, this process would solve problems which raised regarding technology use and how this impacts, I mean, how technology usage impacts children's brain in their social, emotional, cognitive, and physical development. These, was also, these were also raised by the OSED. So it means that there is an urgent need for proactive technology usage critically considering how it could and should be used. But the first question raised, are they really prepared to use technology-based educational programs? I mean, in school infrastructure, because as we can experience even two year old kids, three years old kids are playing with technology. But in most of the cases, these technologies uh, smartphones, tablets, these have touch screens. But if we look around at school level, in most of the cases, schools have desktop computer. And for using a desktop computer, you should use mouse, you should use keyboard or a touch uh, or, or touchpad. 
So of course we raised this question and then developed some tests enhancing programs for the kids to look at how developed they are in this sphere. Pop all the bubbles before you run out of time. In this training, first they have to click on one single really big element and then on several big elements and then on smaller and smaller elements until this time. Switch on the radio. Click on the button on the radio. And then afterwards we go further, we ask them to, to type letters, numbers through the keyboard and even we practice them drag and drop. And if you look at this item first map, you can see that clicking or typing does not mean any difficulties for the kids by doing drag and drop. Even if we ask them doing drag and drop with small elements to small elements, it's really hard for them. But now we know that these operations are really hard for the kids. So we try to exclude this type of task for, for from the task developed for pupils. If you look at the results, after a 45 minutes training, even first graders are able to achieve, I mean, I now I'm talking about the mean achievement above 90 percentage. So it means that we can exclude this mass usage and keyboard usage skills from their final achievement. It's going math or science or reading or other areas. What do we need to know if we want to use technology to support personalized education? First, we need to know how skilled our students are. What do they know in the most important domains of education? The profile of assessment should change their goal from a summative, exclusively evaluation-based approach to a diagnostic, more learning-centered view to use assessment to facilitate learning. Let's see briefly the possibilities of technology-based assessment. Educational assessment is among the most dynamically developing areas in education since the turn of the millennium. In this period of time, as you really no large scale international assessments have become regularly administered by the world's leading test centers, resulting in a huge improvement of data transfer technology and data analysis methods. The direction of these developments have been determined most by the computers that's offering extraordinary opportunities what kind of opportunities we can talk about. We can administer tasks in a more realistic, application-oriented, engaging and authentic context with computer-based assessment. We can use innovative item development, the development opportunities, producing dynamic, interactive multimedia items. We can design more valid assessments. Why? Why? The question arises is why? Why could be technology-based assessment more valid than traditional paper-based testing? Imagine, for example, if we use audio version of the task and instruction, even what we are using in our system, we can exclude the level of reading skills from the final achievement of the students when we, for example, assessing math or science, resulting in much valid test results at the very end. The so technology-based assessment makes it possible to provide instant, objective, standardized feedback thus replacing previous really long feedback times, and to use adaptive test algorithm to fit the difficulty level of the task to the knowledge and skill level of the student. This is also a very, very important feature of technology-based testing. So these issues, instant feedback and adaptivity, are also among the secrets that make video games so popular. We do not need to wait weeks or longer to receive feedback on our performance. And we do not need to solve problems which are too difficult or even too easy for us. If we have to wait days, weeks or months for feedback or 
start playing the game at a level that's too difficult for us, I'm pretty sure that you would never ever play that game again. So there are, these are the areas where technology-based assessment and gate-based learning are converging. So what do we know in 2021? In 2021, there is no longer any question whether we can develop complex, real-world, authentic, high-quality tests. The pandemic, the COVID-19-related schools, closure, and digital teaching have reinforced the idea that the fun science fits all approach is not effective, either in general or in educational assessment in particular. The most exclusively used summative test results do not provide actionable feedback for learners to aid in improving their learning process. This crisis is a really good reminder that beyond summative test results, we can use different type of assessments and we can replace this really high stake test with such type of assessments which can help students learn and which can teach in their teaching process, process more efficiently. Like the world of video games, task and tests which match students ability level with objective feedback are also motivating and they can even result in, in flow if we think on Csikszentmihalyi's Csikszent, 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 term. And this type of assessment can even enable teachers to tailor instruction and support students development more effectively. As I've mentioned already, the profile of assessment should be changed from a summative approach to diagnostic, more learning-centered real use assessment to facilitate learning. So take a look on our three theses on the three axioms we have used in our development. So we assume that the role of teacher remains central in the teaching and learning process so that personal presence is needed in the classroom, especially in the first years of schooling. Therefore, the technology in the proposed model is not meant to replace the teacher, but to provide diagnostic tools to support their work in activities required by evidence-based educational practice. The second reality is what we have seen already, the large differences between pupils. The major challenge is to adjust instruction to the individual needs of every student. Diagnostic assessment may help as it provides information on the actual development level of each pupil. And third, we assume that regular feedback is essential for learning. We also assume that teachers are not able to observe every major aspect of learning without an objective assessment instrument. Furthermore, traditional paper-based instruments are not really suitable for rapid and frequent feedback because it takes time. So evaluation process takes really time. And technology-based diagnostic assessment may fill this gap. If you want to realize a diagnostic assessment system, why do we not need? So let's see the receipt. First, we need a theory. A framework. We need this assessment platform and we need a huge amount of tasks which are based on the theory and these tasks are put in an item bank, of course running in the assessment platform and then we have to be able to know everything about these items, about this task, how difficult they are, how they discriminate the children and so on. So let's see first the theory. If we look around, we can find in connection with all kinds, national and international assessments, the frameworks, even PISA, Teams, PERS, national assessments like SNAPS, they have their frameworks. So we need a framework. And then we need an assessment platform, but how should this assessment platform should be? How it should be? build and look like. So 
this assessment platform should be a learning-centered assessment platform because it's going about diagnostic assessment. It should be an easy to use, but the assessment platform having innovative possibilities. It should have an item builder model, which is able to administer first, second, and even third generation task. It must be able to administer both fixed and adaptive tests. It should be able to administer the task and the tests on any device, smartphone, tablets, um, desktop computer, and even by load speed internet. It should be able to provide prompt feedback for the teacher and students. And it's also very, very good if the platform has a really strong, powerful visualization model. So if we look at that, so that all sounds pretty unfeasible, isn't it? Um, because if the assessment, we had the assessment platform, such a complex assessment platform, we should develop several thousand task bins on this theory and based on this um, item bank. So um, the good news are that we managed to do this and the EDI online diagnostic assessment system is such a complex, really complex assessment system, which can build the basis uh, for personalized learning. The development started in 2009 with the theory. First, we developed a three-dimensional model of knowledge, which is probably the most comprehensive model what we know in this area. Because if you look at the frameworks, even in the national and international assessment, most of the cases they're focusing only on one or two dimensions of knowledge, and we have done it in three, we modeled knowledge in three dimension. So diagnostic assessment, why? Diagnostic assessment system serves its function when it becomes through identifying all important knowledge elements of what students already know and what they still need to learn as it covers them. In the history of education, three main goals have remained clear from the very beginning of schooling and public education up to the present day. So first, to cultivate students' mind, general cognitive abilities and thinking skills. Second, to develop usable, transferable, applicable knowledge. That's knowledge which applicable inside and outside of school context. And third, to transmit content knowledge accumulated and organized according to the values of the sciences. In modern societies, these three dimensions of learning should be present simultaneously, reinforce and interact with each other and not compete for teaching time. So taking research results in developmental psychology and in learning mathematics, reading and science into account, we developed, our experts developed, national and international experts developed a three-dimensional model of mathematical, scientific knowledge and reading, distinguishing the direct curricular aspect, the reasoning aspect and the application aspect of knowledge. So, for example, in case of math theory for our examples and came from, from the field of math theory, for example, this could be the reason why now I bring my examples from the field of math. So, for example, in the case of mathematics, the psychological dimension has been conceptualized as the interaction between students' cognitive development and learning mathematics at school. So the question in this dimension would sound how learning mathematics can contribute to the development of specific reasoning skills and how effectively it simulates students' general cognitive development. In the second dimension, in the social and cultural dimension, which is really close to the PISA literacy um, knowledge model, we could raise the question, how students can construct mathematical models of problems they face, how well they can mobilize mathematical knowledge to solve those problems. 
And finally, if we look at the third dimension, the content, the disciplinary dimension, which is mostly measured in the team's assessments, we can raise the question how students progress with their mathematic studies. We have published this framework not only in Hungarian but in English and a few years later we have published the technology-based frameworks as well and in the second volume of these frameworks we have also published almost 1000 tasks. It, it's good because our teachers can look at it, how our, our tasks look like, how we do the scoring and what type of tasks the students meet when they enter our system. So these books are available on the internet. So, but beyond theory, we need, we need also an assessment platform. And this assessment platform, we have started to work on it uh, more than uh, 10 years ago. And in this assessment program, platform, we have integrated all the knowledge we have collected earlier in the field of assessment in the last 40, 50 years, and our colleagues co collected uh, in the field of assessment earlier. And what we learned about online assessment in Luxembourg by developing the TAR platform, and the TAR platform became later the PISA platform too. So as a result, we have now uh, such a platform which is able to administer tests on any device, whether it's a smartphone or tablet, a notebook or desktop computer, and which is able to administer first, second and third generation items. What does it mean, first generation items? First generation items looks really similar to traditional paper pencil uh, task. However, they are colorful, um, but generally they are fixed um, static items. However, our first generation items in grade one, two, three are not really first generation items because all of the instructions uh, are recorded. So it means that students can listen to the instruction in grade one, two, three. And through this, we managed to avoid the to include in the results the um, reading skills. It's, it's, it's very, very important. So take a look on one of our second generation tasks. Yeah, by administering second generation tasks, we can even measure such type of knowledge, which is unable to measure in traditional testing. And finally, let's see an example from among uh, our third generation items. Here students enter in a, in a simulated the browser area and they have to find different informations that's digital reading so it means that they even meet third generation task which which contains um, such task elements where students have to interact with or which are beyond the usually multimedia um, task element The platform, the EDIA platform, has also a really detailed feedback model. And this feedback model provides teachers a very, very detailed feedback about the student's achievement. Even in this model, our teachers are able to follow the student's development. How is this possible? In Hungary, we do have a special assessment code. This is like an ID code. This is unique for all of the kids, but of course it fits to the requirement of GDPR. So it means that we as researchers don't know anything about the students. We only know the assessment code, but the teacher knows the assessment code. And through this assessment code, we can connect children's achievement and we can even build their developing and following their uh, development. So if the 
teachers enter the system, they can look it at how developed the students are. They can look it at the numbers and tables and even figures. In this web cop, for example, they can see how developed the special students are, and this is indicated with these red lines. The national average is indicated with green, and the classmates' achievement with light blue. In the special case, it means that these students it really good in the disciplinary and in the application dimension of math. So we could say that, yes, this is a really, really brave students and we have no idea that could we develop, train the students more. But if you look at the reasoning dimension, there are potentials in this dimension. So it means that if the teacher knows is, then he you know that, yes, I must develop these students in this, especially in the reasoning dimension and in this dimension, I can reach really uh, or larger developments. And at the very end, I will have really a top student. And beyond this, teachers receive also text-based evaluation about the students. What students receive? A prompt feedback at the end of the test. This is uh, also visualized because of the pupils. The stronger the results, the students' results are, the mobile loans they see over Piggy's head. It's very important because, you know, pupils, first graders, second graders do not really too much about these percentages, but they can count the mobile loans over Piggy's head and then they even post uh, on the internet in several times these results and they are really happy about this. And finally, let's see our tasks. At present, the EDSM system contains uh, more than 20,000 tasks in the field of mathematic reading and science. And let's see some of our tasks. This task comes from the field of math developed for pupils. And this combines the mathematical concept of whole numbers with the assessment of students' inductive reasoning skills in a familiar Hungarian cartoon. Oh yes, and it's not a video, I. The second, and of course this first example comes from the field of the reasoning, it's from the reasoning dimension. The second example come from the application. Putting teddy bears on the bed. And then as you can listen, kids are able to listen to the instruction. And even in this case, we do not think that only one single solution is good for task. And even in this case, it's all the same which bears come on the bed. The sense is that at the end, the kids have their eight bears. And if they have eight bears there, then the solution is of course right. Putting and finally, these exact samples come from the field of the disciplinary dimension. It integrates the understanding of number symbols, the operation of addition, the comparison of quantities and numerosities, and the knowledge of relation symbols. So at the very end now, briefly about the numbers, what do we have at this moment in this database within the whole system? We have more than 10 million test solution in this special database, which is going about math science and reading. We have almost half a million solved tests and almost 95,000 students took part in um, reading math and science assessments in this diagnostic assessment system. And in these databases, we have more than 50,000 items. When teachers and schools are able to use our system, EDIA system is available during the whole school year. For first graders, we have even opened, just opened our mouse usage test and training 
programs, and we also offer our schools a school readiness a test battery. And now in mid of September, we open these mathematics reading and scientists for second graders, third graders, and seventh graders. Of course, second graders receive first graders task, seventh graders receive sixth graders uh, task. And the schools can use our tests through the whole year. And beyond mathematics, reasoning, and science, if the teachers are really interested, they can use their reason, special reasoning skills in springtime. And this covers inductive reasoning, combinative reasoning, problem solving. Uh, it covered creativity, ICT literacy, so tests from different fields than math, reading and science. And the map, if you look at on the map, then you can see Hungary and our partner schools. We have more than 1000 elementary partner schools in Hungary. It means approximately one third of the primary schools in Hungary. So we can conclude that technology-based assessment is applicable in educational context. And these pictures comes from our project. Through the years, we managed to empirically validate our theory, our frameworks, because at the very beginning, it was only a theoretical model. But now we managed to empirically validate it. We designed a special research where 40, 000, more than 40,000 students took part, coming from more than uh, 100 schools. And if we look at really briefly on the results, the internet consistency of the online instruments was really high at both test and even if we look at the subtest and on subtest level, participants score distribution confirmed the applicability of the test and the mean achievement was um, around a 50 percentage. If you look at the item person map for app, for example, math, but all of the item person maps looks really similar in the field of reading and science too. It means that the item banks are really well structured and fit the knowledge level of the first to sixth graders in all three domains of learning. How can you interpret this? The numbers are the items and these bars are the students and they are running parallel. It means that this is, um, our item bank is really fit from difficulty level, the ability level of the students. So we could conclude that technology-based assessment is applicable in the field of mathematics, reading and science from grade one to eight. Of course, we were really curious uh, about the relation between the different dimensions. And if you look at the figure, you can see that the bivariate correlation between the three dimensions were moderate, ranging from 0.6 to 7. Partial correlation was significantly lower, as all bivariate relationships were influenced by the third construct. So we as, as we have seen significant correlations between the different pairs of dimensions at latent level two, beyond the three-dimensional model, we also tested the one-dimensional model with the three-dimensional combined under one general factor. But if you look at the fit indices, they decreased considerably. So the three-dimensional model fit significantly better than the one dimensional model. It means that it was possible to distinguish the disciplinary, the literacy and the reasoning dimension of mathematical knowledge. And we got the same results on grade level two and in each of the domains. So it means independent of the measured domains, independent of the measured grades, the three dimensional model fitted the empirical data significantly better than the one dimensional model. So it means the disciplinary, the application and the psychological dimensions of learning mathematics, reading and science can be empirically distinguished independent of the measured grade. 
and the development of all three dimensions is important at school level. We cannot focus only on the content knowledge or we, it's, it's, it's not suggested to focus only on content and a little bit applicable uh, application, which is very important that we focus on all of the three dimensions simultaneously. At the very beginning of the school closure caused by COVID-19, we launched a new model of the EDIA system, the so-called EDIA kindergarten test model, and made the so-called EDIA teacher test model available to everyone. Both are free and available for everyone, but please note that the tasks are running in Hungarian. The kindergarten model, contains more than 2,050 innovative reading, counting and science tasks, specially developed for kindergarten age children. While the teacher test model contains almost all of the 50,000 items, it means the 20,000 tasks, which are used by the diagnostic assessments. The test can be filtered according to the different domains, topics, subtopics, grade and difficulty level. Then from the selected task, online tests or so-called mini developmental trainings with prompt feedback can be generated. What's the difference between the test and these trainings? Uh, when the teacher decides to uh, to develop a training, then the children receive feedback after each item, whether the solution is right or wrong. And if they fail, then receive the task back maximum three times. All the students need to solve the test is a technological device with an internet connection, for example, computer, tablet, and smartphone. So as we can realize that the smartphone or tablet or computer offers learning programs for you based on your year learning and achievement, as you learn your smartwatch or tablet or any kind of technological device can continuously monitor your learning process and efficiency, more accurate personalized learning programs and explanations can be provided for you based on these data. That uh, technology can contribute to personalizing education by even predicting what types of tasks and activities would be most beneficial for the different students. So finally, about the key takeaways. Um, the fundamental question, how can we best use technology students learn, first of all, leave the fitting for all approach. It is not really efficient in the 21st century. Integrate knowledge from different fields, learning sciences, psychology, assessment, change the what and how of teaching and within this what and how of teaching, change the aim and type of assessment and try to focus beyond the summative assessment on diagnostic assessment, which is more student-centered and which helps students and even teachers to teach. And um, use the advantages of technology-based diagnostic assessment as a tool, supportive medium for personalized learning. And I, I really highlight that all these technological tools and all the technology should be used as tool, which helps teacher to teach their students, but which are not really able to replace the teachers, especially at the beginning of schooling. So thank you for your kind attention and I'm really curious on, on your questions. Wow, thank you so much. You've just taken me personally on a, on a journey down memory lane. If I think about all the connections you spoke about, the theory, the practical side in terms of the assessment platform, and then showing us the wonderful array of tasks and possibilities, uh, your research results are certainly very interesting, and I would love to hear 
from uh, colleagues their questions and comments that they have. Uh, one, of the, one of the questions just to start everybody thinking about as well is, um, I see that you stopped at grade eight for the reasoning and grade seven in terms of the content for maths, reading and science. Um, do you have any plans to go beyond that to the secondary level or are, is, your, is your focus currently on the primary schooling level? Yes, it has, though we had just yesterday a meeting about this and we decided to go further because we received a lot of inquiring mm -hmm. regards from the schools. And even as you could see on our empirical results, there mm -hmm. were seven graders, eight graders, because schools are using our test even mm -hmm. for seven and eight graders and they are really interested. Right. And so we've decided to go further. Of course, it's also needed some uh, financial support. And we I have... can imagine. <laughs> I can imagine. That's another question, but I'll come to that later. Uh, we have a nice question from Jana that I wanted to, uh, to, to ask you about. So do you have any evidence of how the implementation of your assessment system has affected teaching in the participating schools? Yes, it's very interesting and very important question. Uh, we have a, such a partner schools where we are always present. So it means that we bring our training programs there. So these schools use not only our assessment system, but and all of our developments. And the, the head of the school told, one, one of the school told me once that, change their imaging our teacher changed a lot. They have learned a lot about assessment and technology and they, they changed. They changed the way of teaching and using these test results. And as we can say, schools use our test results even for accreditation purposes. So mm -hmm. because they can download really detailed um, feedback from their students and in some cases, you know, the Hungarian school system is a very selective school system. And up behind the selection in most of, there is the parents' education. Right. And, um, you know, if you cannot really compare two kids who has really, really different background, mm -hmm. and then they are selected. And afterwards, in most of the cases, the schools are evaluated based on but the students became afterwards. But um, in, in this course, they, we can even show the development and this added value of the school. And that's also the part when our schools are using the system because the diagnostic tests are low stakes tests. So it's not right. at high yeah. stakes. Yeah. And then, so they can use it as many times as they want to. And through this, they can even involve, not only in this accreditation process, but in the teaching process. And even several times, um, the, our tests are used in such schools where um, kids have some kind of difficulties. And then they ask us to administer them tests developed for lower graders. And then you mm -hmm. cannot imagine. So the happiness of the kids where are eight graders or seven graders, but received tests which were originally developed for second graders or third graders, but they, but at, at the very end they have success, mm -hmm. and 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 yeah, and then they they put it on the internet. Thank you, Edia. So I'm so happy, and several teachers mm -hmm. um, see this, and then and it's also good for for uh, motivation. Confidence. Confidence. And in yes, the future, indeed. my really dream about an adaptive system, because now we are still in the scaling process. Mm -hmm. So as you could see, we have a huge amount of data. So we are able to analyze all of our data on server side because mm -hmm. the database is so big. But you know, even if we have so many data, we cannot really connect students' achievement retrieved from the different grades. Mm -hmm. So it, it's really difficult, 
we can do this in in this reasoning assessment which runs mm -hmm. in spring where we don't yeah. have so many items so as you could see even on the slide we can be a really nice logistic curves and even the teachers can see okay i have a third grader and he or she is on the ability level of a sixth graders or a sure. graders, so they can do this. But in this huge diagnostic assessment system, the teacher can see only that, how developed the kids are among the same graders. Same grade, okay. Um, okay. Yeah. So big dreams. So do you think that uh, you are going to follow up with some kind of big formal evaluation. Um, I'm just following now for you from Jana's question. So Jana, please feel free to come on, put your video on and, and say if you want to, to, to extend the question, uh, but do you see the possibility to do, um, let's say some form of impact assessment um, with the success of what you already have developed before expanding your system more? Uh, do you see that possibility in terms of how it is affected positively? Or, uh, I mean, you have some anecdotal evidence clearly at this stage. Uh, would you expand that further, maybe? Yeah, of course, we are continuously developing the system. Uh, yeah. Now, in the last year, we are really focused on the feedback model. Okay. And we have developed a lot because uh, it's very important, you know, for teachers that they don't need to, to be a math teacher to be able to interpret the results, but yeah. they look at the visualization and then they know I need to have these kids in this mm -hmm. field and so on. And so no, we put a lot of effort on this. Yeah. And now in a few um, weeks, we launched this model for the schools. So we are always developing. So it's a never ever ending process. Never because ending. Even technology develops and the browsers developing. So we cannot stop this development of process. Mm -hmm. I want to give others the opportunity. So if Jana is satisfied, then I'd like to move to Monica. Monica, would you like to ask your own question? Um, because there are a few questions here. Or should I just take it out of the chat? Yeah, I'm not sure that they can talk. So I think you better oh, read okay, it. Yes. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So let me let me read the questions at this stage. So Monica asks, what are the risk and challenges moving everybody towards an assessment system like EDEA? So what are the risk and challenges moving mm -hmm. everybody towards an assessment system like EDEA? Mm, you know, at the very beginning, I thought that how brave would be if all of our schools would join the system? And mm -hmm. nowadays, I think, but we need a control group too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, um, it's an, which is a really challenge to to convince our politician that it it should remain low stakes low stake test system and not yeah, became yeah. a high stake testing because they start to evaluate the schools based on these test results so which is really hard that we we keep this system on this high stake level and then if we manage to keep it on on, on low stake manner low stake. I, I low stake mm -hmm. uh, level then there is no risk because it's for learning this okay, so that's an interesting, you, you raise a very interesting point about the high and the low stakes. And I yeah. think that many countries are grappling in the assessment field with this issue as soon as it becomes high stakes and it's linked to accountability, people yeah. move away from the formative diagnostic style of assessment. So it's producing this tension, I think, in the system that many earlier speakers in the conference were talking about. So it's nice that we are we are coming back to this again in terms of, of an issue. Um, it, it's so very, it, very important. Of course, now I even have a PhD student and we are monitoring in the log files um, mm -hmm. 
what's the difference? Because even students' motivation, test-taking behavior changes if it's going about high stakes tests or low stakes tests. Mm -hmm. And we want to figure out what's the difference, whether we can profile students who behave differently of high stakes tests and low stakes tests and look at the differences and so on. But I think it's very, very important that our tests are low stakes tests and not high stakes tests. Indeed. Okay. So one another question that's come through is, is what kind of feedback do you give to the parents? So do parents get any report of the results that the children are getting? We cannot provide any feedback because, as I mentioned, we want to be GDPR proof. So I don't know who is behind the data. I know only an assessment code, but the schools can and the teachers can download everything. So okay. they even, it depends on the school and on the teacher. They can download the student's evaluation sheet as a PDF or on class level in a zip file. Right. And even they can submit these uh, results, but we cannot do this because we want to be GDPR proof. So we okay. don't know anything special about uh, kids. So it would have to come through the school is what I'm hearing from you. If the school wants to share, yeah, they do. But you don't actually know how many schools do share or don't share. No, <laughs> at no, the stage. Don't. Okay, okay. But there is the possibility to do that. Yes. Um, okay, so, so we have another comment here. And it says, this is a fascinating presentation and development. I'm particularly interested in the nature of the feedback provided to pupils. As presented, it appears to tap ego-related feedback, i.e. percentages, balloons, stickers, which acknowledge achievement performance rather than effort. I suspect that there's far more to the feedback than this and would welcome some elaboration, please. Mm -hmm. um, so. Students receive percentage-based feedback. So it's with these balloons. So it's only for receive, giving something back. But if, if, if you know about assessment, then you know that you cannot compare different test results mm -hmm. if the test contains different items. Mm -hmm. And um, we, in, in assessment time, we administer several hundred tests. So it means that within the the, the probability of receiving the same test within mm -hmm. the same class is mm -hmm. converging to zero. Right. So it means that within the same class, almost all of the kids receive different tasks. Mm -hmm. And if the kids receive percentages, you cannot really compare these percentages. This is the reason mm -hmm. why, but we want to give something back for the kids. So we provide this for the kids, but afterwards mm -hmm. we scale everything so the items are scaled and the teacher right. received a, a scaled um, Right, right. So they have, a, they have an overview of the class. Right, yeah, right, it's right, absolutely right. comparable. And yes. even b b yeah, beyond this, teachers receive not only the numbers, but as you could see, they receive, um, I, I think I haven't shown you, yes. They also mm -hmm. receive different reference points mean achievement of the um, class, of the school, of the, of the region, of, the, of those schools who are located on, 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 on a village or on a city or some different type of um, locations. So they mm. receive different reference points too. And based on these, they can evaluate their students achievement and if, even if they log in the system they can change the um, assessment period so it means that okay. even they can compare the the development how their students developed from last year to this year mm -hmm. whether they become higher now they are higher than the average the national average or they are still above the national average we can see sometimes really really beautiful developments when students mm -hmm. enter with a really low level very very far below the national average and when they leave the school then the average of the class is above mm -hmm. the average so it means a absolutely amazing added value mm -hmm. and of course mm -hmm. we can meet um other stories too. 
I'm sure. Yeah. So as you as you as you develop and as you think of your secondary school development, I can imagine you'll be looking at this uh, feedback in terms of how how the feedback will actually land with the um, older children. So older children, more sophisticated feedback, perhaps for them, um, which will which will also differ a little bit. So let me come and just to give a chance to everybody uh, for this, we have another question about do you have any studies using a strong design with control groups? I think you mentioned control groups earlier on, <laughs> um, where the effect of digital system is compared with the non-digital. Um, yes, we have run some analysis, but you know, it was not really well designed, but okay. is, <laughs> because we have in Hungary a national ABC, a competence mm -hmm. assessment, which is theoretically low stage test for the students but high stakes test for the schools and it means at the okay. very end high stakes test for the kids too yeah. and yeah. then if we compare the changes to the, and the development on these tests of the students then the preliminary results showed that our kids um, achieved higher so they developed more between the different assessment points and of course it can be in the background that they met more tests, they solved more tests, they were more right. familiar with testing and even with technology-based testing and so on. It can be also in the background, but it's very promising. And even, you know, um, when, when, when the kids solve tasks <clears throat> and, and they think how to solve even reasoning tasks, then they develop. So I don't think we can harm. <laughs> <laughs> No, I can I can imagine though from the questions coming from the colleagues that um, perhaps particularly if you're looking for more funding and if you widen your funder base for this kind of development, that the type of uh, studies using a strong design control, so the more experimental studies will maybe help in terms of getting accessing further funding and demonstrating the kind of impact that you know clearly already you're starting to see uh, some signs of of development um, through through the work that you're already doing. Yes, so, uh, our, yeah. so it has also danger. So yeah. several of my colleagues told me that idea is really dangerous because when uh, or, or who has pupils, I mean kids, yeah. small kids, because yeah. uh, they started to show <clears throat> this type of task for their kids. And afterwards, they were not willing to solve paper-based Ah, yes, yes, because yes. you know our our tasks are speaking are colorful yes. they can interact with the task they are moving and they are so interesting and so motivating them that they don't want to solve paper-based task anymore but they want to have computer-based tasks so it's it's danger yes there's certainly i can see that being a challenge and i see that um there's another comment here about, would you say that the this, this system is more effective with respect to learning output and resources <clears throat> compared to uh, more traditional ways? Yes, absolutely. Because uh, as Liberty also told us, so our kids are surrounded by technology. And if something is running on technology, then they are more motivated. And we have yeah. to use this extra motivation, even mm -hmm. if you compare the traditional green <clears throat> table or the whiteboards uh, in the classroom, if the teacher use the whiteboards really effectively and interactively, then they can use this additional motivation power of the kids yeah, and they yeah. can even reach higher learning results. But uh, of course, there is also the possibility to administer computer-based or really third generation task with black and white, no sound, and it's boring. And then if we mm. do this, then the kids won't be happy with this yeah. issue and then won't mm. solve even computer-based tasks. But in our case, as, mm. as we, we have this feedback from the schools that most of the kids, at least the pupils, um, take our tests not as assessment and evaluation and task, but they ask the teacher when we go for playing a game. So they take this type of task as, as a game, as, 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 as something mm -hmm. which is close to playing and not learning. So making learning fun again. 
yeah. <laughs> which is what we what we try and what we're also trying to do to improve the quality of learning. Yeah. Um, one of one of the colleagues here, Monica, is asking about whether the teachers in in Hungary um, are they ready for this? Do they have the knowledge required, including um, a critical eye, when they're using your system? They don't need to have special knowledge. So what, what we need, it's a computer, smartphone, tablet, notepad, desktop, any kind of computer, right. and their internet browser, preferred Firefox or Chrome, and of course, internet connection. And even if the internet connection is low, then we have a special proxy server, yeah. and which is downloaded to one of the computer and our kids can use oh, some okay. SMS, SMS, okay. SMS. High speed. That was going to be one of my questions. <laughs> okay, yeah, exactly. so yeah, that's so interesting. Cool. That's very interesting to know. But I suppose maybe what the colleagues are also getting at is uh, feeding this all into the assessment literacy of teachers. So they may not have to have special, perhaps technical knowledge, but perhaps they have to have a good understanding of how this diagnostic assessment should be integrated within their own lesson plans, within their own uh, teaching and learning schedules, I would guess. Uh, maybe that's what colleagues are also getting at, the sort of assessment literacy that we spoke about um, on day one and two on this conference from some colleagues. I think there were some nice papers there about that. So maybe do you want to say a little bit about that in terms of your vision for uh, the assessment literacy part of the knowledge base that teachers should have? It's a very important question. And um, yeah, I, I haven't told that this system has been developed uh, within a huge amount of projects. And even mm -hmm. in most mm -hmm. of the cases, there were trainings and several hundred of Hungarian teachers took mm -hmm. point in our trainings when we talked about assessment, especially about the diagnostic assessment. We even mm -hmm. introduced our frameworks, the system, how to use the EDIA teach a test model and so on. So they could really have hands-on exercises about all of these who were interested in because they were uh, for free for the teachers yes. because yes. it was yeah. from the project budget. So who were really interested, yeah. they could they could join our trainings and then they could learn about this. And even we, we had a special presentation throughout the whole country where we introduced this and the essence of this, why is it good, how can it be used and so on. Mm -hmm. So I, um, I really hope that um, our teacher can use it um, so that mm -hmm. we, can, we can add them something to, to make to teaching so and the learning process easier. Yeah, so you have do have a sense though that Hungary itself, as a country, as a nation, is ready for this. Um, that's your that's your feeling at the moment. Absolutely, the so we, we have yeah. the infrastructure. Most of the schools are equipped. Yeah. They have at least one or two or several times small ICT rooms, so they are well equipped. We have mm -hmm. also internet connection. How it changes sometimes. It's not so high speed. Yeah, so, as you can you could see we have solved this issue mm -hmm. and uh, so I think our teachers are in most of the cases prepared for this and if if they not then they they have the opportunity to be prepared mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. this so we we, we also we, we usually try to give them the opportunity just switching to a slightly different topic here um, there's another question in the chat and I think it also relates to uh, one, one part, one of the dimensions you mentioned was about the content. So I can imagine that with the curriculum changes, keeping the item bank up to date um, is, is one aspect in terms of not only the technological advancements, uh, perhaps adding more grades that you are planning to do, but also trying to adapt to the curriculum uh, changes, reforms that periodically come uh, with every nation. Uh, I know we've been through about six in the last 20 years, but uh, I can also imagine that that has some impact. So my colleague is asking, how do you keep the item bank up to date? Is there a plan for this? Um, as I suppose, even if you've got 50,000 items, at some point they age, 
they are replenished uh, and and what's the impact on that yeah yes the question is more complicated so to tell mm -hmm. the truth i spent i think slowly several years with our items so because mm -hmm. we, it's a continuous process imagine we had for example such a reading task where our item writer used the web page of a well-known um, book uh, shop mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. but this bookshop closed and the web page okay. disappeared and this yeah. item worked really perfectly through several years and suddenly started to networking and then <laughs> okay. so, of course because the web page disappeared yeah. so um we faced so many things during this more than 10 years then to tell the truth i've spent almost not all but a, a, a large part of my summer time with um correcting revising the items and then because you know we always learn something and of then course. Of we course. have to monitor yeah. because if we if we if we find one single such item, then of course it could come several times in the item bank and then we have to monitor the whole item bank and then if we find something which which, which could work uh, similar and the wrong way, then we have to revise it. So it's really a challenge to keep up to date such an item bank, not, not mm -hmm. from content part, but even from technical issues technical parties um, and, and, and what does your plan for that look like what, what how, how often do you have to do this kind of revision i mean you, you're saying that you're spending summers but gosh i mean do you have a team of people that you can draw upon for this and 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 how often do you have to revise this yeah, to tell the truth this is one of the reasons why i figured out the teacher test model because I, I really hope that in this teacher, because in this teacher test module, our teacher can uh, indicate us if they found not working item or okay. item which doesn't fit to the curricula or which, which where the format is not right. Even if they passed on a really strict way with lectors and then experts and so on. But the teachers can say, come on, this task yeah. is not for sixth graders or the yeah. letters are too small or the pictures are really hard to read and so on and then they can indicate us so we have the message and then we can revise the item in most of the cases if these items have been administered then we have to delete all of the data behind mm -hmm. these uh, items mm -hmm. so it, it it requires also some thinking that uh, <laughs> how big are yeah. the changes um, should we delete all of the data behind this data before revision sure. or the revision is so small that it, it, it it's not really influenced um, usability or the outline or, or the whole item and then we can keep the data so Indeed. and decide on this so to tell through I, I, I'm I'm the only one with one of my colleagues who are able to revise these type of items so because we have the data so it, it's yes. a dangerous process <laughs> sure i can imagine and i know that there are other groups around the world who are also you know struggling with similar challenges uh, funding is one challenge but capacity um, and knowledge and access are, are another i wondered about your um uh, let me just see here. Oh, sorry. Let me just before I change track, come to this other question. Uh, do you evaluate and check the change in item difficulty? <clears throat> Sometimes difficult items after some time become easy ones. I suppose mm -hmm. exposure. Yeah. Yes. So um, we haven't monitored it through the years, but mm. uh, how we put the test together, we I'm really uh, curious on the item position effect okay. because the item position affect the difficulty of the items really mm -hmm. strongly that's the reason yeah. why we have a special design how to how to design our mm -hmm. from this task our test and so we have a lot of such criteria uh, administering a task for 
at least for, for three different grades that at the very end we can do this uh, scaling process yeah. and administering the same task at the very beginning, in the middle and at the end of the task. Mm -hmm. And then all of the tests should contain mm -hmm. reason tasks from the reasoning dimension, from the application dimension and from the disciplinary dimension. So we have really a complex um, design where we try to exclude these uh, differences. Mm -hmm. it, it's mm -hmm. really a challenge and so uh, you're constantly evaluating in other words you you're watching these all the time is, is yes the, is the yes answer. and and to tell you i i plan to involve some german colleagues in this uh, whole uh, final scaling process before putting the system on adaptive uh, version and even it is challenging because we always developing new items and if we have a scaled item bank some somehow we should mm -hmm. put the new items in the item bank too, and we don't know at the very beginning anything about the new items, but we have to scale these together. And then, with, however, one test contains on, only, for example, mass task, but this mass task came from three different dimensions, and our scaling model is a three-dimensional model, right. so um, it's really complicated. Mm -hmm, indeed. And while we come to the almost the end of our time together, I just wanted to ask you <clears throat> about the collaborations you have around the world. Um, I alluded to uh, familiarity with other systems. So I've worked with a group in Durham, for instance, on their, on their PIPs um, um, assessments and monitoring, also looking at primary, but have gone through and also looked at uh, secondary. Um, so I'm familiar with some of those assessments. We also adapted and used them in South Africa with all the challenges about um, data and access to internet and, and all the rest of it. <laughs> um, but I wondered about your connections with, 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 with groups like uh, Durham and, and the group in, for instance, in New Zealand with um, the ASTEL system as well. Are you, are you working together with this? Are you consulting? How, what is the international network um, looking like at this stage? Yes, we have a lot of international friends, colleagues. Mm -hmm. We are working on different projects together, even connected to ADIA. Um, and, but at the very beginning, when, what, what I've also mentioned, um, I started to work with the Luxembourg people who developed okay. at that time the TAR system. Yeah. And then yeah. we developed the TAR further and we have learned okay. a lot. We have learned a lot. It was really challenging and it's very good. Mm -hmm. but our aim were different and so right. that's the reason right. why we decided to launch a new system mm -hmm. and not going mm -hmm. further with the tau but we have learned a lot we mm -hmm. have learned mm -hmm. how how a system works what are the challenges what what what's problematic which would not work in hungary what should we change if we want to have such an assessment system where several thousand items are in which is able to administer task for 600,000 kits at the same time because it were yeah. our uh, yeah. original aims mm -hmm. and uh, based on our tests we can do this so and even through these different projects we we learn how how they do things and then they, we also develop our system further yeah. because it, yeah. it has several models as I mentioned feedback model test administration and to tell the truth we always monitor I, I mm. especially I do this mm. what the different assessment systems can do and then and if I recognize oh there is a good idea then why we, we, we are going to adapt it and then we have a really good doctoral school of education with more than 100 PhD students and they have um, researchers in different countries and in different fields and they and they come with different questions is it possible to do this I'm working mm -hmm. in the field of music and it would be really interesting if I could measure, for example, pressing the button in this <laughs> rhythm, Indeed. can I, Indeed. Can I uh, log uh, the answer and so on. And, and, and these, um, these questions are really challenging. I like these. And then afterwards, we are sitting with our developers <laughs> together and then we figure out how to solve all these really very sometimes 
strange uh, <laughs> questions. But then in the very end, we, we, we yeah. have a, 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 a really a lot of opportunities in the system. It's wonderful. The doctoral students, I always say, and the postdoctoral students, they're there to challenge us all and to keep us on our toes and bring some innovation as well, uh, new thinking into our systems. But um, I'm going to start to round off now because we're about to have our door closed. And I just wanted to make sure that everybody had who wanted to ask a question had had the opportunity. And uh, perhaps I can just formally thank you very much for what has been a thoroughly um, insightful learning experience also for myself, but I'm sure for others and learning about what's happening in Hungary and the system, uh, very impressive, your learnings, your research that you're doing. Um, I think it's been a, a wonderful journey with you this last hour and a half. And just to thank you very, very much. And I see the thanks also coming through in the chat. Uh, deep gratitude for the work on this presentation, the run up. I want to also acknowledge Eugene, who's been instrumental in getting uh, the keynote also on the calendar um, to our co link conveners <coughs> behind the scenes, our co conveners. And I see there's a special thank you from our link convener, uh, Monica Rosen as well, who's thanking you very much. So just a, a real note of gratitude from our side to say thank you for taking the challenge. Uh, thank you for being our first uh, female plenary speaker. Along, It's a very nice uh, loop for me because uh, where the first uh, speech was actually also related to ICT, Integrated Pedagogy, from one of our founding members, uh, Professor Chied Plomp. So it's a very nice to come back all these years later and uh, start to talk about how it's being integrated and used in the field of assessment within our education systems. So thank you very much indeed. And we look forward to seeing you back in our network um, at some point in time. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you colleagues for being here and also to Laurie who was in the background in case we had any technical difficulties Obviously, she did a very good job <laughs> because we didn't. <laughs> and uh, thanks to everybody for their participation. Really yeah, one, appreciate it. One uh, small uh, detail at the end that the, um, remember that the uh, presentation was recorded. So once it gets processed, it will be posted to the Network 9 uh, website. And you can you know go look at it again or share with uh, others. Thank you, Eugene. Thanks very much indeed. Thanks, colleagues. Thank Have you. a lovely day further. Bye. We'll see you in the next <laughs> session. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Have a nice day. Thank you. That went very, very well. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, sure, you must be tired after all that, but that was great. Really appreciate it. And we look forward to hearing more of your work. I'd be very interested in what you're doing. And I'm going to go and follow up now straight away. <laughs> to, to see what I can see. Um, I know other colleagues who'd be interested in getting in touch with you okay. about your system as well. So if that's all right, I'll put you guys in touch. Okay. I really hope slowly we can do it even personally. <laughs> yes, that would be that would be wonderful, really. Yes. Sure. So well done. That so, was great. Thank you again for sharing. It was really lovely and really nice. So thank you. And thank you very day. much. Bye. Yeah, have a good day. Bye-bye then. Bye.